Will you lift your hands for a moment? I just want you to tune into that for a moment of just saying, God, I thank you for the cross. There's no one like you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We press into you tonight, Lord. We love your presence. We love you. We love you.
Sing hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome. 
Good morning, happy Sabbath, and welcome to all of you who are watching the service today. The airing of this service coincides with one of the, with one of the most important dates in all of Christendom, October 31. And no, it's not because of Halloween, it's anything but. It is for something way more glorious and beneficial and biblical than that. When most Christians or even historical scholars think of this date, they remember a certain man called Martin Luther who nailed his 95 thesis statements to the Wittenberg Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany on this very day in 1517. 503 years ago, wow, time flies. But the most important phrase of Luther's life, which God used to get his attention, is this simple phrase, the just shall live by faith. A simple phrase, isn't it? Yet this very scripture, which was repeated in the mind of this lowly, desperate, fearful German monk in Rome, changed the world forever. On a pilgrimage to Rome in 1510, Luther was ascending what's called the Scala Sancta, or Holy Stairs in Rome, the steps Jesus walked up and down upon during his trial by Pontius Pilate in Jerusalem. Brought to Rome by Emperor Constantine's mother, Helena, in 326 AD, according to Catholic tradition, the stairs, quote, out of devotion, are ascended by the penitent faithful on their knees. In 1893, Pope Leo XIII, quote, granted that the faithful who ascend the steps of the Scala Sancta, holy stairs, on their knees with a contrite heart, praying and meditating on our Lord's passion, his crucifixion, may gain an indulgence of 300 days per step. This indulgence is applicable towards the souls in purgatory. Now, 300 per step times 28 steps. That's 8,400 days or 23 years of indulgence to escape from purgatory and to enter heaven for either you or a loved one. Sounds reasonable. But as Luther took part in this ritual, which the Bible does not support, he heard the words, the just shall live by faith, being repeated in his mind repeatedly as he prayed to Mary or the saints, something which the Bible doesn't support either. This simple phrase, the just shall live by faith, is found in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. See if you can find it. And quoted by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 1, verse 16 through 17. It kindled a movement towards the end of the 1260 years of papal supremacy, which we know today as the Protestant Reformation. Luther obviously did not begin the Reformation in Europe. Oh no, he came more than a century after men like John Wycliffe and John Huss but this event in his life marked a key turnaround in biblical and practical understanding. Luther later wrote of this experience, quote, Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement of the just shall live by faith. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy God justifies us through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors into paradise. This understanding is the basis of his 95 thesis statements in 1517 and his famous trial at Worms in 1521. It ultimately led to the translation of the scriptures into, our common, into the common language of the people, so people of Germany could read the Bible for themselves, something which they couldn't do before then. And to be honest, I think we all take for so much granted today. This phrase portrays God's faithfulness, his love, his law, his grace, and the gospel as a whole, and proves the absolute impossibility of being justified by our own works in place of Christ's righteousness and his faithfulness. With this new understanding, which was in fact knowledge which had been purposefully hidden from the people by the church for nearly a thousand years, people realized they did not have to confess to a priest or to pay penance for forgiveness of sins, no, we can go straight to Jesus Christ and rely on his merits as our saviour, as taught in the scriptures alone, or in Latin, sola scriptura. Did the church like this teaching of Martin Luther? Oh no. Wanting to reform the church based on this teaching out of love for the salvation of the people, he did not want to start up his own church. That was the last thing which was on his mind. Yet, he would be classed by the church as a heretic simply for speaking against the church's doctrines or teachings while relying upon his conscience, his own way of thinking, which was quickened by the Holy Spirit and the scriptures alone. 
Other reformers had come to the same biblical conclusions as Luther and had suffered the similar consequences and even worse, being burnt at the stake. God's messenger Ellen White wrote about, wrote about this very thing in 1890 when she wrote, There is not a point that needs to be dealt, dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the, than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Later on, she actually says that it is treason if we try to do that. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone, his faithfulness. Join us today as we learn how God brought Martin Luther into this experience and how it affects the understanding of our faith and how works and salvation are intertwined today. I invite you to join in the singing of these hymns throughout the service, starting with with one acknowledging that Jesus is the one who died for us and he deserves all the praise for our salvation. Crown him with many crowns.
Hi church, it's uh, time now for the offering, tithes and offerings. I invite you to give generously just as Jesus did with his life. He gave his life on the cross for all of us. He gave his time, his energy, his resources. Every day of his ministry, he was with someone, healing, giving, helping. So I invite you to give. And the offering today is for the Castle Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church, your church. I love Castle Hill Church. I hope you do too. And uh, we'd love for you to go to e-giving and, uh, and give there. And if you're not able to, uh, Richard Harrell is at church on Mondays from 2 to 4 p.m. where you can see him and uh, he can work through that with you. May God richly bless you. Good morning, kids. There was once a chocolate factory, a world famous chocolate factory that used to send its chocolate everywhere, all over the world. And kids everywhere knew the name of Willy Wonka, who was the man who made the chocolate. But no one had ever seen inside his factory. His factory was a big secret and he never used to let anybody inside and people they heard rumours that it was a wonderful place where there was rivers of chocolate and rooms full of chocolate, but nobody had ever seen inside until one day Mr. Wonka announced a competition and he was going to give away five golden tickets to five lucky children to come and see inside his factory. Wow. And how would the kids get the golden ticket? Well, he was going to hide them inside his bars of chocolate. So if you went to the shop and you bought a bar of his chocolate and came home and opened it up, maybe inside you would find a golden ticket to go inside his factory. And so what do you think happened? Everybody all around the world started buying lots of chocolate so they could open that up and see, oh, have I got the golden ticket? to get inside Mr. Wonka's chocolate factory. You know, tickets to, can be really exciting things to have. Uh, I like riding on the train. Do you like going for rides on trains? Well, to go for a ride on a train, you need a ticket too, don't you? And my train ticket looks like this. And if I want to go for a ride on the train, I have to walk up and I have to tap it on the machine and the machine will say beep. Yes, you've paid, you can go for a ride on the train. Well, the machine might say, Meh, you don't have enough money. Because it costs money to ride on the train, doesn't it? And you have to have a ticket that has money. <clears throat> what about flying on a plane if you want to go visit America or France or Botswana? You have to get on a plane and to get on the plane, they won't let you on unless you have a plane ticket. That's right, you have to have the ticket and then you have to pay for the ticket and then you can get on the plane and fly wherever you want to go. Uh, what about going to a big concert at maybe the Opera House? You need a ticket. If you wanna go and see the Olympics or the grand final of the football, you need a ticket for that too. And all these tickets, they cost money, don't they? You have to buy the tickets to get into these events. But what is the best place that you could ever imagine? What's the best ticket in the world that you could ever get a ticket for? Well, actually it's not in the world, is it? It's a ticket to heaven. A ticket to heaven is the best ticket that you could have. And we all want one. Now, some people think that to get in a ticket to heaven, you need to lie down on a bed of nails. Oh, that sounds prickly. Some people think you have to walk through the fire to get a ticket for heaven. Some people think you have to climb the stairs on your knees all the time to get into heaven. Some people think you have to be good all the time or be perfect to get into heaven. But they're wrong. You can't get into heaven by earning it. You can't earn a ticket to heaven. You can't buy a ticket to heaven. You can't even win a ticket to heaven. So how do you get a ticket to heaven? 
guess what? They're free. Tickets to heaven are free. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, I would like a ticket to heaven, please. And he will say, here you go. I have bought this ticket for you and it's all yours for free. Isn't that great news? Let's tell everyone that tickets to heaven are free. Bye. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold a faith lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Till I shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps enlighten. Teach me the danger of these realms below. That lamp of safety or the gloom shall brighten. That light alone the path of peace can show. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combine. Till night shall vanish in eternal day. Good morning and uh, a warm welcome as uh, we prepare for, you know, the day's proceedings um, as we celebrate a beautiful Sabbath. Um, we've all come through a long week. Our week should have been different. So I think uh, let us just come to God in prayer. And uh, yeah, if we just close our eyes and uh, yeah, let's all join in. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you've carried us for another week. Our weeks may have been different, success and some trying times, but Lord, you're always there for us. I thank you that you give us the breath of life each day and that we use that appropriately. Um, sometimes we don't know what the answers look like, but uh, you know, you're know you always there and walking by our side. And uh, yeah, you raise us each day and uh, you give us new hope. And Lord, in these times of COVID, um, as the world has experienced, we've seen, you know, lots of losses that, uh, you know, let us remain in faith and hope. We pray for our church family here, our pastoral team, Lord, for new vision for the conference as well as, you know, it's very trying, trying to keep people on the road. We pray for our Pastor Pablo, um, you know, who's always um, put a lot of time and effort into each one of us. We pray for the various ministries that, uh, you know, we can carry on no matter the struggle out there, that we can bring together the likes of our pathfinders, our youth, our retirees, all these things. And it all looks different, Lord, but, uh, you know, as uh, we have you in our heart, that uh, you carry us always, be with our families, you know, be with the world out there, those that don't know Christ, and let us as messengers, you know, let our light burn brightly, and uh, yeah, we pray for all these things, for the musicians today, for the message they will bring through music. And uh, yeah, let us just lift your name today, Lord. And always we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 from the new KJV. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Good morning, Castle Hill Church. It is a great pleasure for me to worship with you on this Sabbath morning once again. Uh, it's been a while since I had the chance to speak to you, to spend some time with you, and it is kind of weird because I'm being recorded right here and you'll be watching me later on the screen, but I know many of your faces behind the computer screens or TVs, and it gives me a great pleasure to be with you once again on this Sabbath day. So I will speak about God's grace today. This is the topic that uh, the pastor asked me to speak about uh, because we're facing a, another anniversary of Lutheran Reformation. So this will be my topic today. So let me just begin with this. Some years ago, I read this book that you see on the screen, uh, Finding God in Unexpected Places. That was a, quite a transformational reading for me. I read this book and I realized that uh, I have to change my thinking a bit. I grew up kind of thinking that grace of God only works within the church and specifically within the Adventist church. And I never looked for signs of grace outside of Adventism as I was growing up. Reading that book really helped me to look for signs of grace everywhere that God is working with all people out there. When I think about the funeral, when we cry about somebody who departed, this is a sign of God's grace. When I think about every wedding that is happening um, <clears throat> out there in the world, this is another sign of God's grace. And I started looking for signs of God's grace everywhere. It was a great read and I recommend this book to you. When I was a young pastor here, in this church uh, almost 30 years ago, I remember once I found grace in the pub. Uh, I was giving Bible studies to a man by the name Peter, and he was uh, living in a, a little RV caravan kind of situation, and once I came and he was not there, I went to, I knew that he would visit his local pub, and I would go to that pub, and I preached the gospel to him in that pub. I saw him sitting there at the chair talking to his friends. He, he was so apologetic. He, he was just saying to me, please forgive me, I forgot. But I said, no, 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 we're going to have a Bible study right here in this pub. And I looked around that place. I saw God's grace, people talking, people chatting, people being with each other. I was with that man. That was a sign of God's grace. God's grace permeated this world. Ellen White was not surprised. In Steps to Christ, she wrote this beautiful statement, in the matchless gift of his son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. And it is the church, it is Christ's church that was called to be the reservoir of God's grace. And yet sometimes it seems to me that we find more grace outside of the church than within. Why is it? I think that this is because often we misunderstand what grace actually is. So today I would like to talk about grace. And in the process we'll talk about Martin Luther remembering the great preacher of grace as we face another anniversary of the Reformation. So let us bow our heads before we begin. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you right now asking that you will be here with us through your Holy Spirit. As I present the message that I prepared for today, I pray that you will bless me, that you will anoint my lips, and that you will anoint the ears of those who would listen. Thank you for your presence on this Sabbath day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As Adventist Christians, we should be very familiar with God's grace. Uh, after all, we belong to this great group of uh, denominations called, that we call ourselves Protestants, Protestantism. 
our theological roots go right back to the 16th century Reformation. And uh, the 16th century Reformation was just about all about God's grace. And grace eventually became a part of our seven-day Adventist message. In Revelation chapter 14 and uh, verse 6, we find those words. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-air, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. Three angels' messages are really all about God's grace. The eternal gospel is about God's grace. So at the very center of eternal gospel, we find grace. And yet... As Adventists, we, all, we often have this kind of ambivalent approach towards uh, God's grace. We approach God's grace sometimes with distrust, uncertainty, at least in my experience. Maybe not in Castle Hill Church, but in my 30-year experience in ministry, that's what I have witnessed. On the one hand, we love the idea of God's grace. It is a wonderful thing uh, we believe that salvation is by the grace of God and it's a wonderful gift from God. We speak about it in Bible studies. We talk to people about this. We study this in Sabbath school lessons occasionally. There are articles in uh, the record on the theme of God's grace. On the other hand, when we speak of salvation by God's grace alone through faith, this is the message that Luther preached by God's grace alone through faith. Sola gratia e fides. That means no strings attached. We often become nervous, ill at ease, somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, and, and we kind of think this grace is a nice story in, in theory, but be careful in practice. So I'm a third generation Adventist, I'm son of a pastor, I'm a pastor myself. And as I was growing up uh, and in my ministry, I would hear things like this. This pastor only speaks about grace. What about keeping the commandments? What about obedience? Or other Protestants speak about grace. We have a special message as Adventists. Or if you speak so too much about God's grace, Adventist standards go down. And I heard this sentiment 30 years ago, even in this church where I was a pastor here. And some people would talk about cheap grace. I believe that God saved me by grace so I can do what I want. That's a classic definition of cheap grace. That I can do whatever what I want. God saved me by grace. I don't have to worry too much. Have you heard sentiments like this? I have. Often the fear of this idea of cheap grace prevents us from embracing the message of God's grace. Perhaps the, the reason behind this is because uh, we as Adventists, we emphasize commandments quite a lot. And maybe we fear, some of us, we fear that if we speak too much about God's grace, we forget about commandments. I can only say one thing to this. There's no such thing as cheap grace. Grace. Grace is never cheap. Uh, combining the cheap with grace is an oxymoron. It is an impossibility, biblically speaking. The truth is, however, that the more emphasis we place on behavior, the more we forget to talk about God's grace. And the more we talk about God's grace, the more problems, conflicts, and trouble we'll have in our churches. So if we really want to follow Jesus, if we, would, if we call ourselves his disciples, we do not have a choice. We must speak, we must preach about God's grace all the time. So I would like to take you on a little bit of a journey to the past. We're going to talk a little bit about Luther. We're going to study a foundational passage that... Uh, basically broke Luther. This is a very important passage uh, for him. And the passage is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. This was our scripture reading for today. But this passage is absolutely foundational for 
the Protestant Reformation. It was foundational for Martin Luther who began the Protestant Reformation. And here we find what Paul uh, said in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And I've got this one sentence highlighted in the middle of that passage. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. There's probably few sentences in the Bible that caused more problems in Christian history, more controversies. This sentence for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. There were wars, there were divisions. To this day, Christian world is divided over this sentence. For Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, understanding this passage, he understood this passage in one way, and then he suddenly understood this passage in another way, and this was the great breakthrough that began the Protestant Reformation. Uh, Luther lived in the world where he was told that he's not good enough, that he will never be good enough. Uh, he will have to do certain things in order to be good enough. He would have to obey what the church would tell him. He would have to obey the commandments. He would have to do this and do that and do this. Only then, maybe, perhaps, God will look at him favorably. And when Luther looked at this passage, he really struggled. And I'll tell you in a moment why he struggled. Because this passage can be read this passage for the gospel, this phrase from this passage, for the gospel, the, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, can be read in two different ways. Can be read in righteousness of God or righteousness from God. And it makes all the difference. Okay, so righteousness of God or righteousness from God. And both ways of reading uh, that passage is grammatically correct. You can read it of God or righteousness from God. And this is where is the most important message of the Reformation. So let me just, first of all, explore this righteousness of God. This is the world in which Luther lived. So here I have a tape measure. Okay, so God gives us a certain standard. This tape measure is a standard of measuring. If you want to measure something, we put a standard and we know exactly how wide this pulpit is. So this is a standard. So imagine that this tape measure is a standard of God's righteousness. God is right here. He's righteous in this spot here, in this bulk of the tape here, in this casing, and he gives us a measure here. So you need to, he tells us what to do, and you need to just climb up. You need to do certain things to please the righteous God who is right here. So you have to obey the commandments. You have to just climb up. You have to do this. You have to do this. And you work to, God tells you what to do, and you just go up, go up measuring according to certain standard, and God one day will look at you and will say, okay, you are good enough. You've done well enough. Or he will tell you, you're not good enough. You have not done enough to measure to my standard. So Luther always felt not good enough. Not good enough. The frequent result was he didn't know where he stood. Luther didn't know where he stood before God. And the church of his day milked it as a fundraiser. That's how they were fundraising money. Just keeping, that, keeping people in uncertainty if they will get to heaven and they, will, they would scare people with hell. And they would just tell people, okay, we will tell you what to do. You can pay us a little bit. And those, that term was indulgences at that time. You pay us a little bit and we can assure by your payments that we will get you to heaven 
one, to heaven one day, will make sure that God will love you. So Luther never felt that he was good enough. You know, as a young church pastor, when I came to ministry in 1990, I met a lot of young people. In my previous post, I, the Castle Hill was my second church. I was in Blacktown first for a year, then I came to Castle Hill. And often when I spoke to young people, when I would visit with them, they would say, I don't feel I'm good enough for God. I don't think I'll ever be good enough. I'm just unable to reach God standard. So this is that kind of mentality that we measure ourselves when we think about it. We measure ourselves. Are we good enough according to God's standard? This is that righteousness of God. You check yourself against the standard and you find yourself not good enough for God. It is difficult to love this kind of God. And Luther hated him. And he speaks about it himself. This is what he wrote about that phase of his life. He says this, Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. You see, for I hated that word righteousness of God, with which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. When I left Castle Hill, I went to America for eight years where I studied there at the seminary at Andrews University. And I returned and I became a pastor in, in remote place. And I remember talking, there was a small church, I remember talking to people who used to be Adventists. And it was kind of sad to me to hear so often from them that, that this phrase, I am not good enough to come to church. Sometimes I would plead with them, please come, come join us, join the community, we'll love you, we'll care for you. Uh, no, 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 I, I, I have to fix my life first. Another guy would tell me, I walk sometimes past the church and I look at the church and I said, why don't you come in? I'm not good enough. I need to fix my life before I can come in. What would people say? If I would come in, I cannot come in. Somebody would say, the walls would fall on me if I would come to this church. I heard that from many people, sadly. You know, talking about my own story, this is how I view God for majority of my life until I got to know God, really. Uh, you know, some of you know, I grew up in Poland until the age of 22. I came to Australia in 1986. This is when I learned to speak English. I was 22 at that time, and I had this kind of mentality when I came to Australia, that God saves me by obedience to the commandments. If I don't obey, I will not go to heaven. Obedience was the key of my salvation. And I remember to this day we sang in Poland in, when I was growing up those songs that one day God will weigh me on the scales of the heavenly scales and will find out if I'm worthy to get to heaven. You know, sometimes when, I, when those melodies would come to my, back to my mind, when I remember them, they still scare me. This is the whole thing. Am I, am I good enough? Am I measuring enough? For God, will he ever love me? As I was growing up, uh, we did not have good materials for children. Uh, TED, which is Trans-European Division, would send us their materials. We could not read English. No, none of us could speak English at that stage. We lived behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, but we could see pictures. And so the teachers in Sabbath school um, for children would take those pictures to teach us about God. And I remember those pictures. Some of you may remember those pictures. That this, uh, the teacher would say, look, you will stand one, one day, you will stand before God. And, and God, or this angel in this case, would look at your life. 
and will ask you, are you measuring up? What would you say? And I remember as a young boy growing up, as a teenager, imagining myself like that angel right here, like that man here, uh, standing with his head down and, and just not knowing what to say. You know, in my work as a teacher, I worked for a number of years as a teacher in mission fields and uh, uh, in, at Andrews University. Often my students worry about this issue of obedience. They ask me what role obedient play, obedience plays in the process of salvation. We'll talk about this in a moment. But when you think about growing up, when you think about, I don't know if it's happening in uh, Castle Hill Church because I have not attended here for too long in recent years, but in many churches that I've attended over the last 25, 27 years since I left, I've heard many children's stories that, that emphasize obedience. The teacher would tell a story and they say, what is the moral of the story? Children obey, children obey. And children are hearing this obedience, 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 and they grow up to adults, never certain, when never certain they will measure they will ever measure up to God's standard when they are adults. And as a result, some abandon faith. I met people who say, I don't care anymore. I hate living with guilt. I hate that guilt that I will never measure up. But that passage that we just read can be understood in a different way. And this is what we call in history of theology Luther's breakthrough. Luther's breakthrough. This was that great paradigm shift. This is why we call ourselves Protestants today. Because that phrase, rather than being understood righteousness of God according to God, which God measures up, it can be understood righteousness from God. It's a huge change. It was a huge change in Luther's thinking, uh, foc focusing very carefully on this passage and reading it within the context of the scripture, within the context of the book of Romans, he realizes that God is not writing about righteousness according to which he measured people, but about righteousness that he is wanting to give to people. As a gracious and merciful God, he gives us this righteousness from him to us as a gift. Instead of expecting us to, to fulfill this, this thing, it is God who does it for us. And this is the whole idea of that phrase in that passage later on, the righteous shall live by faith. It is God who does it for us. It is God who fulfills the condition of salvation for us. Obedience is a requirement, but God did it for us. And Luther focused on this. The righteous shall live by faith because God did this for us. So once again, we have this tape measure. You see, the standard is the same. God established this standard and it's found in the scripture. And God wants us to be saved. And he knows our hopeless situation. He knows that we'll never be able to fulfill the standard. We'll never be able to fulfill condition to go to heaven. Instead, God does it himself. He comes down to us. He fulfills the conditions of salvation and he takes us with him on the right. Isn't it great? Just tells us, hold on to me. Hold on to me. The eternal life is a gift. You don't have to pay for it with your obedience. This is as Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. When Luther understood this point, when he understood the difference between off and from, his life changed dramatically. 
I liked what the translation by Eugene Peterson, when he paraphrases this passage, he says this, saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It is God's gift from start to finish. We don't play a major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we need to make nor save ourselves. Well, just to further develop this, this scenario, uh, just a parable. Just imagine, imagine this. Uh, an analogy of coming to Avondale College University. You heard about this great institution, Avondale College, University College now, and you want to go there. Now, I know that some people are skeptical about Avondale. Uh, I understand this. This is just a parable here. Uh, although I have to say a lot of good things lately about Avondale, both of my girls are at Avondale, and they're studying English and math, and they just love it. It's a great place, and I'm very grateful for Avondale, that place that they could go after we arrived from America, and they could go to Avondale and find new friends. So I'm very grateful for Avondale. Uh, but nevertheless, this is just a parable here. Okay, so you heard about this great institution somewhere in Australia, and you'd like to go there and study there. So you call, or send you up, they send you your application. Uh, you heard great things about this, this place, so you really want to go there. You fulfill the application six months in advance, but there is a catch. You have to pay because you're a foreign student, you have to pay for the first semester in advance. But there's a problem. You live in a poor country. You don't have that much money. Uh, Avondale is in Australia. Uh, the exchange rate is very bad. You don't have any perks from the government, like or study or something like this. But you really want to go to Avondale. So you have a choice. You can either forget Avondale Okay, you can forget Avondale, or you can try to save money to go to Avondale. So you decide to save money. You have enough time, so you save really hard. But you have a problem. You don't earn that much. Really, it's not enough to save. You have to pay for rent, you have to buy food, you have to buy clothes, you have to pay for the doctor and so on. Uh, even though you try very hard, you save nothing. Your wages are very low, and there's just not enough to save. To add to this, you have a problem. Nobody knows about this problem, only you, at least you think so. You're a pornography addict. In secret, you spend a lot of money on internet to pay for your addiction. You fight this tendency, but it just doesn't work. Temptation is too great. And, and you, are, you like to spend money, if you have this little money on some gadgets, like, like a nice iPhone or something, or a smartphone, whatever, uh, the result is, in the end, you do not have any money to go to Avondale. So shrugging your shoulders, you say, oh, well, I tried. I worked hard. I did all I could. I did my best. I tried to save, but forget it. I will not go to Avondale. So you decide to call Avondale on the registration day and, and when somebody picks up the phone, you say, I'm, I'm so sorry, I, I tried my best, I tried to save money, but it was not possible for me. I will not be coming to Avondale, I'm so sorry. There's a moment of silence. And then the person says, could you wait for a second, please? I'm transferring you to our uh, financial student financial advisor. What's the point, you think? I will only be further embarrassed. Hello, how can I help you? You give your name, explain your situation once again, and then she says, you don't know? You don't know? Your account is paid in full. You can come and begin your master's program or whatever program you want. I was just writing an email confirming this, that your account is paid in full. You are completely bewildered, stunned. This must be a mistake. No, 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 there's no mistake. I've got your name right here. 
How could that be? This is impossible. Who, where did the money come from? The advisor look, look, looks up at her computer and gives you the name. Your older brother who immigrated to Australia some years ago. You are stunned. He knows everything about you. He knows about your addictions. He knows about your spending, overspending, and few other things that you don't want anybody else to know. Some years ago, you got mad at him, met him because he wouldn't send you money, and you, you haven't been in touch with him since. Despite all of this, your older brother paid for your entire education. Still stunned, you, you grab the phone and dial your brother's number. Hey, hello, I, I'm so sorry I haven't been in touch for so long. I, are you okay? I'm calling to thank you. It was very nice what you did for me, but, but, but you really didn't need to do this. I, I would manage somehow. Uh, let's make a deal. I'll pay you back. No? No, at least a little bit. Just at least half. No? Look, you have, to, you have to allow me to pay you back. Let me just pay you at least $100. I have to pay something back. No, 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 says your brother. This is my gift for you. If you want to give something back to me, even $100 or even $5, my gift becomes a discount. It's no longer a gift. That's it. That's it. Grace. God knows everything about you. He knows that you are gambling with sin. And despite of this, he still wants you, want to give you the gift of eternal life. Grace. There are no secrets with God. In spite of this, he embraces you as part of his family. Grace. It is something you do not deserve and never will. The word deserve does not belong to God's vocabulary. It does not exist in his vocabulary. Grace. There's nothing you can do for God to love you more. There's nothing you can do for God to love you less. Grace is completely for free. If you keep commandments to get to heaven, if you want to be obedient to get to heaven, salvation becomes a salary. So if we try to be good and try to be good, okay, and try to, try to be good so that we can get here, salvation becomes your wages, your salary. This is not what the Bible says. God alone pays for our salvation. Did you hear this? God alone pays for our salvation. It is that teaching, that teaching about God's grace that makes Christianity so different than any other religion. This is the genius of Protestantism. Soli Deo Gloria. This was one of the famous slogans of Protestantism, like solideo, soli, sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura, and so on. Soli deo gloria means glory to God alone for my salvation. Glory to God alone. Glory to God alone. Luther discovered this, and his life completely changed. Okay, so we've been talking about grace. We've been talking about grace. All right, grace is, is wonderful, right? It's a great concept, wonderful concept. What about obedience? I told you we'll talk a little bit about obedience. Aren't we supposed to keep the commandments? Does not God call us Seventh-day Adventists to keep the commandments, to tell the world about the Seventh-day Sabbath, which is the fourth commandment, to emphasize this commandment? What is obedience? What, what role does obedience play in this whole plan? The answer is really very simple. And it is found in John chapter 15, or oh, many places in the Bible. But I often go, to, back to, go back to, chapter, to John chapter 15 and verses 1 to 6. And this is what John says there. 
I am the true vine, my Father is the gardener. Remain in me, remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither you can bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man or a woman remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So what is our role? What is our role? Our role is to remain in Jesus. Okay, you may say, I heard it a thousand times in church. Another preacher preaching cliches. So let me explain this in another way, in a very biblical way, how all of this works. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Have you ever been in love? Have you ever been in love? A uh, stupid question, really. Everybody gets in love at some point, right? Everybody falls in love at some point in their life. Okay, so let, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a second. Just think about the moment when you fell in love. Or you had a crush on someone. Remember that moment when you fell in love? How does it feel? How does it feel to fall in love? What kind of, when you love somebody, how does it feel? It's a great feeling to be in love. But it's even greater when somebody responds to your love. How does it feel when you love somebody and that love is returned? I remember when I met this beautiful woman. I thought she was the most beautiful woman in the whole world. And I think she still is, uh, 30 plus years later. But I remember when I fell in love with her. What an amazing feeling it was. But I wasn't 100% sure at some point at the very beginning that she will reciprocate the feeling back. And I remember that precise moment somewhere close to Newcastle when we went for a walk. And on that particular Sabbath afternoon, we're just walking side by side. And I took all the courage that I had and I grabbed her hand. And she, didn't, she did not pull her hand away. Oh, I cannot describe to you what was happening in my heart at that moment. It was the most amazing feeling. And, and many of you know how it feels. When the love is reciprocated, it's a, it's a great thing. It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful. So how does a person who is truly in love behave? How does that person behave? And you know how, how that person behaves. Uh, when, when you are beginning your love relationship, you, you know how, how you relate to one another. How do you behave? Why? What makes the person to behave in that way? You know, when we started going out, my wife and I, just a, two or three years before I came to Castle Hill as a youth pastor, I was the nicest guy I could. I hope I still am. But, but I was the nicest guy to my girl. I would do anything she would ask me to. You know, I avoided to doing things that would upset her. I changed my clothing style because she didn't like some shirts or something. I changed my uh, hairstyle. I changed my eating style. I chose not to push the buttons that would upset her in any way. I think at that stage I became a really, really nice person. And the more I loved her, the more nicer I became. And you know, I already had her. She was already my girl. She became my fiance, and I just loved her so much. I wanted the best for her. I still do. I didn't do this to earn her love. I did this because I was in love. Another illustration. When I was uh, studying at uh, Andrews University, I was preparing for my doctorate. Part of the thing that we had to do was to study German and French. Not to speak those languages, but to be able to read and to understand the theological uh, language that we, we had to read and so on. And this was the hardest thing ever. 
You know, I'm not, I was not interested in learning German or, or French. French was a bit, bit nicer. It's a, it's a, it was a little bit easier. But German, oh, that was so hard. I remember spending the whole semester slogging and learning those words and, and, and just trying to remember the German phrases. And it was so hard, so difficult. I couldn't wait until the semester would end and I would be able to pass that exam and put the German behind me and never look at it again. <laughs> but imagine if I met a girl. If I met a girl that I would fall in love with that girl, but she would only speak German. And I speak English or Polish and she speaks German and nothing else. What would I do? Would learning German be a problem for me? I suspect not. I would spend hours learning that language so that I would be able to communicate with her, be able to speak her the same language, understand each other. So what does that have to do with obedience? It is very simple, very simple. Throughout the Bible, God is portrayed in a variety of ways so that we may understand him. So God is so incomprehensible that through the prophets he had to use metaphors in the Bible to tell us who he is and how he behaves. So we've got various metaphors portrayed here on, <clears throat> on, on the slide here. God is the rock. God is the shepherd. God is the shield. And you see all those metaphors tell us something about God. God is a tower. God is a potter. God is a warrior. And even in one place we find God as a mother hen who takes its chicks under the wings and protects them. But there's one image in the, new, in, in the entire Bible, actually, one image that is most often used by the writers of the Bible. And it's an image of a lover, of a guy who loves a girl, a guy who falls in love with a girl. From the beginning of the Bible to the very end, we've got this image, okay? Marriage at the beginning is a symbol of God's relationship between him and humanity. And at the end, <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the last book of the Bible, the Apocalypse, the last chapters, Jerusalem comes down as a bride prepared for the bridegroom. So throughout the scripture, we've got this metaphor of a lover, God who loves his beloved. And who is beloved? Who is his beloved? His beloved are his people. And throughout the scripture, we've got this message, apart from message of love, but also message of betrayal, message of prostitution. The, the fact that when people are unfaithful, it's, it's a prostitution, adultery, all this kind of stuff we find in prophetic messages. But overall, we find God who is in love. God who is in love. He's in love with his people. He's in love with me and with you. And when Christ was on this earth, he established his church. When he left, he's got his bride on earth. The bride is his church. And Paul makes it very clear in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ, husbands, love your wife. This is very often misunderstood passage when it talks about submission and so on. I don't have time to go to this, but Paul says, Husbands, love your wife so much that you are willing to sacrifice your lives for your wives. But then Paul says this, for this reason, man shall leave the father and mother and be united to his wife. The two shall become one. And then he says this. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Jesus, the lover, and his church, his bride. You know, God loves you in the same way like a young man loves this young woman. Like that young woman loves that boy. And God says to you, love me. Love me in the same way. Fall in love with me. Test me. All God wants is to be loved 
back. And just like when you are in love with somebody, truly in love with somebody, you want the best for that person. You don't want to hurt the relationship. You don't want to do anything that would hurt the relationship. You want to protect the relationship. You want to protect that person. You always think the best of him or her. And you choose to do those things that bring pleasure and joy to the person you love. Not because you want them to love you, but because you're already in love. You know what I'm talking about. Because everybody experienced at some point of his life, experienced, the, experienced love, what it means to be in love. Same with God. He's your creator, he's my creator. He loves you and me desperately. He knows what is best for us. People who truly know God, people who truly love God of the Bible, they will follow his commandments. Not to earn his love, not to go to heaven, not to avoid eternal destruction, but because you know God. You know God who died for you, who gave his life for you so that you may live. You fall in love with that God. This is the true biblical understanding what obedience is. It's simply loving back. I'd like to conclude my message with a story. Richard Seltzer, the surgeon, tells of a young man and woman he just operated on. So Dr. Seltzer writes, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies. Her face is post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny tweak of the facial nerve the one to the muscles of her mouth has been severed. She will be thus from now on. I had followed with religious fervor the curve of her cheek, of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor from her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed. And together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they? I ask myself. He and this woman, with the tortured mouth I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, so greedily. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It, it's kind of cute. All at once I know who he is. I lower my gaze. Unmind, unmindful of me, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I, and I so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that they kiss still works. I hold my breath and let the wonder in. My friends, Jesus, like that young husband, twisted his body on the cross to let you know that the kiss still works. We are his bright. We are the reservoir of His grace. What are we going to do with this in our relationships? On media conversations, in conversations with our neighbors, in conversations with our children, with our spouses. Remember, as the bride of Christ, you are the reservoir of his grace. 
May God bless you. Thank you. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you are willing to leave heaven, become a human being, and die for us so that we may live. Thank you for your great love. And thank you for this teaching, Lord, that there's absolutely nothing we can do to earn your love, that your love to us is pure gift. All I can ask, Jesus, is that you will recreate in us that love, the true love, the flame of that love that you have for us, that we can respond in the way you want us to respond. I pray that you will bless everyone who will listen to this message today. Bless each one of us that will reflect and remember this picture of you as the great lover of heaven who loves us no matter, all, no matter what and gives us the gift that we do not deserve. Thank you, Jesus. We're praying in your name. Amen.
Thank you for watching Church with us today. I loved it. I loved watching Dr. Darius talk about righteousness by faith. I love the music. John, thank you so much for your time and effort and energy and getting the orchestra together and the singers. Thank you for all that's happened today in our worship. Let me invite you to join us next week. Next week we have a youth service. Pastor Nick Cross will be back and he'll be leading in that service through God's word. And also one special announcement on December 5 at 1 p.m. at church, we're going to have a combined church picnic on the school oval. That's for everyone. So we'll watch the church service from home all together, united as one. And then we'll all drive to church, bring your camping chairs, your own picnic. And remember, COVID restrictions will still apply. And that's so important for us as we come together. December 5, from 1 o'clock onwards, we'll have a great afternoon together. God bless you. We'll see you next week.